A very warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Dharana 24. Have you forgotten about the estate sector? Have you forgotten to speak of the aspirations of the young people of our country? Um, yes, we're faced with an economic crisis, but how do we um, look at the future ahead for the country? I've invited to our studios to discuss uh, all of this and much more. The State Minister for Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure, Jeevan Thondaman. <laughs> Vanakam, are you Vanakam. born? <laughs> um, it's, it's lovely to see you here in, in our studios. We don't see you much uh, in the media, although um, right after your father's demise, we did see you. You were a sensation um, in the media, on social media. Was that planned? Um, no, so this is something that I've been meaning to clear up for mm -hmm. quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, right after my father's untimely demise, I was uh, you know, put on the spot where you know, I had to make a decision whether I wanted to contest or not. And I felt that it was something that I, it was owed to the people to begin with. And we also thought of changing the mentality of people in upcountry. Mm -hmm. We wanted to bring in a younger, more vibrant upcountry. And that was one of the key decisions for contesting. However, I remember the, um, the, the effects social media had uh, after that. For example, um, right after my father's demise, I remember there were certain, certain characters in social media who mentioned that, in fact, I pushed my father down the stairs and, you know, to take over and things like that. So I realized social media is quite a toxic place. But the sensation that you're referring to happened when they said that I used my father's funeral to propel myself into politics. Did you? I did not. Because the thing is, what people don't realize is, like you said, I don't come in front of the media that often. And I, in fact, worked with the party for a long time before that. Mm -hmm. I was the youth wing general secretary and I was also the... Deputy General Secretary of Ceylon Workers Congress. So, despite all that, that picture, you know, the famous picture of me on top of the car, mm -hmm. that was taken during the funeral proces procession when people started coming to the roads in, you know, uncontrollable numbers. And it came to a point where the army nor the police could not control them. So I was requested by the army to, in fact, uh, ask the people to step away from the barricade. So there were close to, you know, there were thousands of people by the road. So I had to get on top of the car and in our tradition, our custom, prostrating is a form of respect and it's a, it's a way to request people to do certain mm -hmm. things. So that's how it uh, this came This is about. also during the height of the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and Correct. in Colombo we, we had a lot of reports about this. But uh, you were out of uh, the country uh, for the longest time ever. Uh, tell us about your um, time outside the country and you're back here doing politics um, in, in, in an area you didn't uh, have much experience as a child or a as a teenager? No, I wouldn't say I did not have much experience with my area because I grew up in this area, you know, I used to come. It's true I didn't stay in Sri Lanka for my primary schooling and my middle schooling. But the reason behind that was, as you're aware, Sri Lanka has been ravaged by a 30-year war. And in this war, one uh, factor that played a key role in me leaving the country was that, you know, um, minority leaders were targeted mm -hmm. quite often. And my father was a prominent minority leader. I, and also, I'm sorry, I don't like to use the term minority. He was a Tamil-speaking Sri Lankan uh, member of parliament and a cabinet minister that too. So, you know, when that was the case, there was a, you know, we had received many threats. And it was for that safety we had to leave the country. Despite the fact that we did not, you know, want to be separated, it had to be done. But whenever we did come back, our days were spent in Lower Area. And it was spent with the people. So it is not a territory that I'm not familiar with. Uh, your father was in politics for nearly three decades uh, right. um, and he has fought for the rights of the estate workers, the community there. Uh, but how far do you think uh, they, they, their um, aspirations, their needs and, uh, and all these uh, the, the, the efforts that your father fought for have been realized over the years? Well, to, you know, to answer this question, we must first understand history. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, many people seem to have forgotten the history of estate workers. So after the independence, right after independence, we were disenfranchised. The Indian origin Tamils, mm -hmm. if I may say so, the IOTs. We are scattered across Sri Lanka. We are not only in Norelia. We range from Vavunia to Gaul. And, you know, we were disenfranchised. Our civic rights were removed from us. And we spent a good part of the late 19th century fighting for our rights, mm -hmm. our rights which were you know, denied to us for over 30, 40 years. So, you know, in 1948, after our rights were taken away, until 1977, we had no uh, 
identity or recognition as Sri Lankans. So it was due to that unfortunate circumstance, many of the um, many of the rights that were entitled to, many of the benefits that were entitled to were not given to us. And to be honest, it's only in 2009 did we attain uh, the full civic right for our community. Mm -hmm. Because up until then, there were many people who did not get their civic rights. So when you're deprived of your civic rights, obviously you're going to be deprived of every benefit that comes through the government. If I may you know, go a bit more specific, for example, in Nuwarelia, in all other parts of the country, you'll see, you know, for every 250 families, you have a Grama Sevaka and whatnot. But in Nuwarelia, in places, you'll see for every 3,000 families, every 4,000 families, in certain cases, every 7,000 families, mm -hmm. you have a Grama Sevaka. So the question is, why is it like that in Nuwarelia? It is because when the, when the Grama Sevaka uh, divisions were being drawn up, when the GS divisions were being drawn up, only the Sinhalese, the, uh, the Christians and the Muslim families were taken into account. The Indian origin Tamils were not taken into account. So, you know, we were deprived of many of those benefits. And apart from this, when we took over, when we finally got our civic rights and our late leader, Swami Murthy Thunderman, had uh, taken over, you know, uh, gotten into politics, we went into development politics, mm -hmm. you know, development-based politics. We understood that we needed a political solution. You know, we were part of TULF as well. But the reason we came out is because there was a difference of opinion, you know. The North and East, they wanted a separate state. We wanted separate identity. We just wanted recognition for the Indian origin community, which we did not receive. So we went into a more development-based politics. We focused on building schools and building roads and things like that. But to answer your question in short, 30 years down the line, have we developed much? No, we haven't. And that is not because of any political party or any union. It is because the Sri Lankans have refused to integrate us into mainstream society. And that's the sad part of it. Uh, are you saying that successive governments uh, ignored the plight of the estate community? We saw the Srima Shastri agreement um, decades ago. Um, and, and thereon, do you think we've forgotten but the rights of you, your if community? If you look at the Srima Shastri agreement, you know, I personally do not agree with that. I think it was one of the uh, biggest injustices done to, you know, Indian Ocean Tamils in that sense. Because it, when you, you know, they are not cattle. They are human beings. And they are second generation, third generation Sri Lankans whose forefathers have worked for Sri Lanka. You know, the free education system in Sri Lanka, which we boast about, was built on the backs of tea estate workers. And this can't be refuted. So when you're a second generation, third generation Sri Lankan, you have no roots to India. You don't know where you're from in India. But if you look at the agreement, you know, there was a ratio where I think I believe 40% was supposed to be mm -hmm. repatriated back to India. And this 40% were from the same families. And, you know, that was very inhuman. And that is one of the greatest injustices that has gone unnoticed in Sri Lanka, unfortunately. So, you know, the, so these things have happened, you know. And I mentioned this in Parliament as well, that successive governments have neglected the state community. And when I say they've neglected the state community, I do mean the political representatives who are representing the community as well. Now, for example, even though my party has had two powerful cabinet ministers in the government, we have done whatever we could have done with what was given to us at that particular point of time. For example, um, it is during, um, I believe, the late 90s, mm -hmm. the early 90s and the late 90s, where we started industrialization in the estates. My uh, uh, late leader, Swami Murthy Tondaman, was the one who had bought in garments and, in fact, so many other industries to Nuwarelia and other plantation sectors to give a way out for the informal sector in the upcountry. Mm -hmm. For example, there's over 1.5 million Indian origin Tamils living in Sri Lanka, out of which only 135,000 people are working in their states. So what happens to the rest, you know, the informal sector? And this is not something an average Sri Lankan would know. They refuse to acknowledge the fact that there are Indian origin Tamils living with us. Uh, I'm trying to understand here. Your party has had representation in governments. Uh, right. uh, hasn't that been sufficient for you to uh, sort out so the as issues I mentioned, to represent uh, and fight Right. So as I mentioned saying. earlier, even though we've had representation in the government, you know, first we had to fight for our civic rights, mm -hmm. which we received. And right after that, we went in to do development, which hadn't been done in the estate sector at all. As I mentioned, the 30 years we were deprived of civic rights. We were deprived of everything else along with that. We were deprived of health care. We were deprived of education. We were deprived of housing, sanitation, so many things. Why? Because all the estate land, even though it's JDV and SPC, they were given on lease to the companies. Mm -hmm. And the companies had taken exploitation to such an extent where they neglected the schools that were under them. They neglected the 
health centers that were under them. They neglected the roads that were under them. Mm -hmm. You know, they refused to do these things. So when they refused to do these things, we were lagging behind. You know, you compare the estate sector to another rural sector in Sri Lanka, we were lagging behind by 30 years. So for example, if a rural sector somewhere down south had roads and hospitals and, you know, schools, basic facilities, we didn't have any of those. So we had a job to do, which is cover up 30 years of, you know, uh, the development which has been neglected mm -hmm. in a short span of time. And that's exactly what we did. We bought in a school every three miles. We made sure we focused on education first. And right after that, we went into, you know, creating access because without roads and transportation, there's no sort of access. You can't expect an economy to grow in a household when they don't have access to basic things. So, you know, we focused on those things. So what was needed at that particular time, we have done that. And most importantly, I must say that one thing that many people don't understand is that the Indian origin Tamils, the estate community, the plantation sector, is the, are the Tamils that did not take part in the war. You know, we in fact stood by Sri Lanka's economy during the war. You know, we helped in tea exports and tea plucking and that has gone unnoticed as well. You know, because that is something we had to uh, stick our neck out and do. We had to protect our community and prevent them from taking part in the war. Um, I'd like to go back to um, you. Uh, you studied in London. Um, you, you studied law at uh, the Northumbria University and then at the London School of uh, Economics too. Right. Uh, but again, you're coming back to Noreria, um, where your roots are. But my question is, how far do you understand the plight of these people too? Because uh, it seems like you are in a, an entirely different world out there and you're in Sri Lanka and also in, a, in, 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 a, in an area where uh, the rights of the people are still uh, not fulfilled. So how, how do you try to at least approach them and understand um, the, the, their uh, daily needs and what they're going through? Well, the thing is, when election came in, when we had to start our campaign, I, you know, we made a decision that we are going to speak only about what we are going to do mm -hmm. and what we are going to offer to the people and what are the issues we see within the community. And it is because we identified those issues and we were able to give possible alternatives. That is one of the reasons why I was voted in. Because now in Norelia, I, I understand the fact that many people may say that, you know, it's because of sympathy that he got into parliament. But anybody who understands the political terrain in Norelia knows that it is not a simple task to get over 100,000 votes in Norelia, yeah. especially, like you said, for somebody who is not famil familiar with the territory. But as I mentioned again in the starting of the interview, that I had, in fact, worked in Norelia for quite some time. And when I came in to work in Norelia, we identified so many issues which were not spoken about in the past. For example, everybody who you know had represented Norelia had focused on the tea estate workers. We focused on the children of the tea estate workers, the informal sector. What are they going to do for education? What are they going to do after that? And apart from that, this is something that many people are unaware of as well. So in Norelia, as you're aware, people are living in line rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a it's a name that's synonymous with everyone here. People are living in line rooms. People always, you know, say, why are people suffering like this? They're living in such harsh conditions. But you have to look at the problem from a, you know, take a step back and look at the problem. People are living in line rooms because they don't have rights to own land. They've been living in for more than 150 years. If you give people in Norelia and any other area where plantations are there, where line rooms are there, if you give them the opportunity to build a house, they can afford to build a house. This is what people are not uh, comprehending. People living in the estate sector, they are more than capable of building a house. But today in a line room, line rooms don't have toilets, by the way. Mm -hmm. This is something that has to be known. Line rooms don't have toilets. Tomorrow if a worker in a line room tries to build a toilet, the manager of the company immediately comes, brings the police, demolishes the, line, uh, demolishes the toilet, takes action on the estate worker. So these sort of you know, th these sort of exploitations are taking place. Mm -hmm. So these are the issues we identified because every other place, now there are so many land right ownership programs for people living in Sri Lanka, but for the estate workers, there are, there's no opportunity. Why? Because we are considered as employees of, you know, uh, the companies rather than, you know, citizens of Sri Lanka. That is the problem. Um, what is your perception of what we term the national question, what we have termed the national question for years? the Tamil question, the larger uh, north northeastern issue, and um, what we've, the, the three decade war and post-war reconciliation, plus what we're fighting at the UNHRC. As a young person representing 
that part of the country. See, now, uh, to put it simple, first, if you take a look at it post-war, you know, whatever said and done right now, you know, access has been created, development is ongoing, Sri Lankans are walking around in peace, and it's not the same situation what it was 20 years ago. So that is a step up, but the problem is, it's like you said, post-war reconciliation. How does that take place? And that can only take place only when there's ethnic harmony amongst the communities, which means there has to be ethnic harmony amongst the people of the government as well. You know, people have to be willing to listen to others. People have to be willing to, you know, be all inclusive. You know, take into account what the Tamil sentiment is, what the Muslim sentiment is, and all that. But at the end of the day, my stand has always been that, you know, regardless of us saying, you know, I'm Tamil, I'm Muslim, I'm Sinhalese, it has to be I'm Sri Lankan. You see so many parliamentarians who are pro Tamils, pro Sinhalese, pro Muslims, but you don't see many parliamentarians who are pro Sri Lanka. You know, and that's the issue. So without answering that, we can't get to the national question. And with relation to UNHRC, I'll just simply say that our global reputation is a reflection of our domestic policies. So given our global reputation right now, then I'm sure you'll be able to connect two and two. Um, I'd like to talk about the Sri Lankan identity going forward, but right after this short break here at Hyde Park to stay with us. Welcome back. We are in conversation with the General Secretary of the Ceylon Workers' Congress and State Minister for Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure, Jeevan Thondaman. Now, many parties um, aligned with the ruling, the governing party um, coalition or alliance have distanced themselves in recent times. What is the view of the Ceylon Workers' Congress? How are you working with the government now? And overall, given the current economic crisis, do, does your party have any concerns in the way the government has been operating? Well, uh, to start with the parties that, are, you know, that were aligned with the government who are currently disturbed, mm -hmm. the thing is, you know, I believe there are 11 parties, if I'm not mistaken, and the 11 parties are being led by senior parliamentarians, senior politicians, you know, who we have a lot of respect for. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I can't comment on their views of the government. But as for the views of the Ceylon Workers Congress, what has to be understood is that, you know, even though we are with the government, we are a coalition party. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, if we are not happy with the functioning of the government, then, you know, our first option is to voice it out. Second option is to see if there's an alternative. Mm -hmm. And third option, worst case scenario, is we'll have to take a step back. But with relation to the estate community, with relation to you know, um, the rural community in general. There have been times where the Ceylon Workers Congress has criticized the government. For example, you know, with the uh, Muslim burial issue, the Ceylon Workers Congress voiced out their concern. You know, we said uh, this is not fundamentally right, in our opinion. And uh, secondly, we even voiced out our concern with the fertilizer issue, because at the end of the day, the Ceylon Workers Congress does represent a majority farming community. And, um, you know, we voiced out that concern as well. So just because we are with the government does not mean that we are going to, you know, uh, say yes for everything. But at the same time, you know, we are not just going to uh, leave the government high and dry. This situation, this pandemic, whatever said and done, yes, there are problems that could have happened due to mismanagement. There are problems that could have happened, you know, due to person A, B, C. But at the end of the day, this pandemic is bigger than politics. And this is not the time where you should leave a government high and dry. And there's a time where we should look at solutions. Now, for example, there are the opposition is there. There are so many other parties in the opposition. If you look at it, you don't see many alternatives coming out of it. You know, they, they are identifying the problems. But the, if you look at the issue in this, the problems are identified even by the ruling party. We are aware of the problems. We know that there's no gas, no diesel, no fuel, you know, no dollars. So we don't need somebody pointing it out to us. But rather, somebody could come forward and say, these are our alternate solutions. And we are willing to come to the table, sit and explain it. So that way, you know, I must applaud uh, Honorable uh, Harshad Silva and Honorable Eran Vikramaratna because they, you know, took a step forward. They went and met the central bank governor. However, it would have been more productive had all the parties, including the rural, uh, ruling party, got them together, sat and come up with a solution. But whatever said and done, uh, whatever said and done, right now, if you look at it, the government has taken steps. And, uh, you know, even though we have taken steps a bit too, you know, a bit delayed, a step forward nonetheless. Are the leaders open to listen to your concerns, recommendations and solutions? Well, as far as I'm aware, 
you know, the, let it be His Excellency the President or even the Prime Minister. Whenever we've had concerns, we have brought it up and they were addressed. For example, now with the plantation sector, we mentioned that, you know, uh, out of all the communities in Sri Lanka, the plantation sector suffers the most due to economic crisis. So something had to be done for them, you know, a subsidy of sorts. So anything just to lessen the blow, you know, because at the end of the day, they have children, they need to send the children to school. That costs money as well. So, you know, uh, so one solution we did come up with is uh, the reduction of the wheat flour pricing for the estate workers. Mm -hmm. So at the time this decision was taken, we had actually made six requests out of which you know, one came through, we're waiting for a call on the remaining. But, um, you know, so at the time this call was made, I think uh, the, the the price of wheat flour was 135 rupees. Mm -hmm. And uh, we said we will give it to an estate worker at 80 rupees for 15 kilos, cap it at 15 kilos. And we will provide it at 80 rupees per kilo. And today, that has been a, you know, been sort of a concession for the estate workers because right now wheat flour, I think, is at 180. So, you know, these little, little things have been addressed. But if you look at it, to get out of the situation, we need a permanent economic plan. So now the council was created, the advisory committee was created along with that. So, um, you know, we should hope for a better tomorrow. But let's talk about um, your, your, your uh, plans, how you see Sri Lanka going forward. Uh, we're talking about an economic crisis. Let's move out of uh, our discussion um, uh, focused on the estate community, but at the larger national economic crisis that we're faced with right now. Um, as a future generation of politicians who are to take over the country going forward, what are your aspirations for this country um, going forward? We've been talking about being uh, Asia's maritime hub, Asia's um, logistics hub, and we've been talking about investments, but right now we're struggling with paying our fuel bill um, and providing gas and other uh, necessities for the public. Uh, yes, we've been talking about years of mismanagement, prudent, uh, imprudent decisions taken by uh, successive governments, but yet, the question about the ruling government failing to address this um, during the past few years, two, two and a half years, is a question. So where do you see Sri Lanka going forward? Well, now, the past two and a half years have been, <coughs> sorry, the past two and a half years, they have been, you know, quite a storm in Sri Lanka, not just in terms of, you know, the financial situation, but in terms of everything, you know, we had to go through, we might have to go through food shortage and things like that. And so the past two and a half years have been rocky. And, to be honest, it is completely, you know, I would not like to put the blame on one particular individual or, you know, one particular entity. It is a it is collective responsibility. I'm in the government. At the end of the day, I'm as accountable as the next person. So we have to be held accountable for that. But as I said earlier, it's about moving forward. And to move forward, two important decisions were taken. One is floating the rupee, which agreed could have been done earlier, but it's better now than never. And similarly, also yesterday, according to the president's address, we are willing to work with the IMF and uh, we just have to wait for developments on that. But however, I would like to draw an example to India. So back early, earlier in the, in the 1990s, if you look at it, there was a Prime Minister, Mr. P. V. Narasimha Rao, and it was under him the economic revolution took place in India, where there was a complete shift of economic policies from India's conservative, traditional economic policies. They shifted into a more open, liberalized economy. And I feel that is also a pathway we should explore. But we can't explore any of these pathways when, you know, um, when, first of all, there is an issue of religion overriding logic in this country. So when that happens, it's difficult to attract investors, number one, and more so difficult to change our economic policies. Now, let's say if our economic policy is centered towards the West, mm -hmm. we will have issues with that because then people will come and say, no, they are going to uh, go towards the West, they're selling out our country. And even with the IMF, when the decision was, said that you know we are going to go we are going to go have a discussion with the IMF there were certain people who were very unhappy with the decision they said no going to the IMF is selling out the country but then you do have a larger section of society which says going to IMF was the right decision at the end of the day what people need to understand is that let it be politicians let it be the general public what people need to understand is the fact that when we go to the IMF IMF is not an authority that is you know um, that is that has a hard and fast rule we can sit down, there are negotiations. At the end of the day, it has to be within our comfort zone and their comfort zone and we have to see how to work things out. So at the end of the day, if there's so much of, you know, um, issues against going to that authority, then we have to see how far are we, you know, from changing our economic mindset and economic policies. 
because traditionally speaking, if you look at our economic policies, there has never been a permanent economic policy. You know, what is, our, what is the backbone for us in that sense? So to answer that, we would, you know, honestly need individuals who are, you know, sp who are experts in that particular field, not just people who, you know, are elected and are in parliament because of that. We need individuals who can turn the country around. In your view, did this government lack uh, proper economic advisors and counsel um, during this past two and a half years? See, the thing is, nobody knows the pandemic. Right? Uh, you know, even now, we thought we curbed the pandemic, and now apparently there's another strain that might come about which can, you know, uh, harm the countries. So things like this are unpredictable. So at that particular point of time, the decision taken, you know, it was taken in view of saving the country. Nobody wants to make a decision that will cripple the country. So a decision was taken, and unfortunately, that decision did not lead us on a right path. But at the end of the day, the government is willing to set the course right. You know, we are bringing in experts um, who are, you know, cap who are more than capable of turning the economy around. And at the same time, we will need the cooperation of the opposition and, you know, members of the ruling party as well. This is not a time where we can look at politics. This is a time where everyone needs to get together and, you know, brainstorm and see how we can get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. And if I may say so, just one last thing, you know, we are we uh, we are compared to, con uh, uh, we are compared to the governance of such uh, places like Tamil Nadu. You know, for example, recently I was asked, why can't uh, we follow what Tamil Nadu did? Tamil Nadu recently appointed a economic council, you know, uh, economic advisory council with, you know, Nobel laureates and so many different entities. But, you know, we also have to understand the irony in this. If we were to do that, you know, appoint an economic council with Nobel laureates and foreign entities, you will have voices that will instigate from within the government and from outside the government that, you know, we have brought in foreigners who are going to, you know, um, set the, eco uh, the economic structure according to their wish, according to their country's wish. So th this is the problem, right? We need to take a step back. We need to sit down with everyone, regardless of their party preference and their political preference, and come to a solution. Mm -hmm. But but we saw the Samagi Janabalavegya bringing in uh, numbers of people to Colombo here where they protested the government moves and the current <coughs> situation of the country. The situation has, um, has, has led to uh, a time where people are openly uh, upset and expressing their displeasure over the government. This is, we're talking about a government that won a massive mandate, but you're a party to this government. So aren't you making these uh, voices heard within the government strongly? Um, so two things. First is that we are addressing whatever issues, whatever issues that have come up. Mm -hmm. You know, not just with the state sector, with issues. I mean, even if you look at all my speeches in the parliament before, it's not only focused on the state sector. In fact, it ranges across a wide, uh, you know, wide disparity of issues. So the thing is, we have brought up these issues, and every time we do bring up issues, we don't have to do it just, you know, in front of media for the sake of it. You know, there are places where certain issues need to be brought up. And also, one more thing is, even though we are party to this government, I mentioned it earlier, so what should be my next best thing? Resignation is not an option, because as I mentioned, the community that I owe duty to, you know, by resigning, they are not going to gain anything out of it. At the end of the day, we have to look at development-based politics for the people I represent. But at the same time, if injustice is done against them or any other community to, a, to an extent where it can't be looked back on, then we will have to rethink our choices. And apart from that, I would also like to say that you mentioned about the opposition's protest that took place day before yesterday, on 15th, if I'm not mistaken. Now, I must, you know, uh, give credit where it's due. The mobilization of such a huge number of people, it's, it's something that has to be lauded. But at the same time, you know, I have certain concerns with the protest as well. And this is not me trying to defend the government, but this is me trying to, you know, echo the thoughts of many people, you know, who saw the protest. For example, now, when the protest came, took place, first of all, the only thing that I could take out of the protest was that the main slogan of the protest was, hand over the government to us, let us run the government. Mm -hmm. But anybody with political knowledge, anybody who is within the political sphere, knows for a fact that there can't be a government change right now. You know, And we have to look at what other possible scenarios are there. So the opposition, in my opinion, I, I'm not trying to advise the opposition by any means. You know, I'm just trying to say, as the youngest member of parliament, as a young citizen of Sri Lanka, what I would have expected. I would have, in fact, expected the opposition to rather come up with alternatives. If they had, say, maybe 10 or 15 different solutions for maybe 10 or 15 different problems we are facing, 
and they were able to mobilize such a large crowd, and they could have brought forth those alternatives and submitted it. You know, that would have carried some weight. That would have shown a proactive opposition, not an opposition that did a protest just, you know, for the sake of showing dissent. At the same time, you also have to look at it in this sense. Yeah, the protest that took place day before, was it a protest that was, you know, uh, used to show people's uh, displeasure against the government? Or was it the glorification of one person and their party? Because to me, it seemed more of a party-based mobilization. But then again, as I said earlier, they mobilized a lot of people because of the displeasure against the government. But it could have been done in a better way. Is what uh, what fresh perspective do you offer uh, to navigate through this economic crisis? Well, first of all, I think we have to start from you know, um, where the root cause of the problem is, where I, which is the parliament. You know, one thing I must say is, there's a women's caucus in parliament, and they're doing a fantastic job, regardless of you know them being in different uh, political parties. And same way, I feel a youth caucus needs to be established, because with the youth caucus and with the women's caucus, if these two entities can work together, then I feel a lot of solutions can be you know achieved. And apart from this, so that is one part of it, because at the end of the day, you need to fix the governance, and then you can go on to the grassroots. And the second part of it is, if you look at it in this sense. You have to look at who are really suffering during this pandemic, who have suffered during this pandemic. So to put it in perspective, there are two kinds of you know, people who have suffered. One, um, actually, let, sorry, let me let's scrap that. Well, what I would like to say is, so if you look at it, the rich yeah. during the pandemic, yeah. they got richer, and that's not something you can deny. Even with the floating the rupee, the exporters have uh, doubled their money, tripled their money, in fact. Then if you look at the poor, people below the poverty line, people below the poverty line, you know, they're not after gas, they're not after all these things, people below the poverty line, I'm talking about extreme poverty, they are looking at, you know, they have home gardening, they, they, they live on a daily basis. You know, it's a hand-to-mouth basis, which is quite sad to say, but that's the reality. And due to the pandemic, I think over 4.5 million, there has been a 4.5 million, uh, you know, increase in the number of people who are below the poverty line, so that's quite sad. But the people who have really suffered during the pandemic is the middle class, you know, people who have taken debts, people who have taken loans to study, people have taken loans to start up, you know, a, a business, entrepreneurs. Because all these people, the middle class, if you look at it, the gap between the upper middle class and the lower middle class, there's a wide gap. The lower middle class are extremely, you know, uh, low on the belt and the upper middle class are a bit higher. So the middle class are the ones whose issues need to be addressed to begin with. So for example, many businesses have shut down, many startups have shut down. And we are talking about, as a government, we're talking about promoting startups, encouraging startups. So what should we do? We should, in fact, look at how to revive the businesses that have been shut down. You know, there have been many people who have come up with brilliant ideas, who have started it during the pandemic and unfortunately shut down. And they are in a lot of debt. They are facing a lot of financial pressure. So we have to see how can we ease that burden on them, how we can help them restart what they wanted to. Because, see, for you, for me, for certain people, you know, um, starting up a business, yes, you can start it however you want. But for certain people, you know, they put their life savings into it. They literally put every single thing they own into it and then they end up losing everything. So first, a solution needs to come to that because that will vice versa, uh, you know, impact the economy as well. And apart from this, you know, we are talking about self-sufficient Sri Lanka. So we have to see how far we have come as a self-sufficient nation. So in that sense, I would like to also, you know, applaud uh, Honorable Minister Kanchana Vijay Sekhar for his contribution, because I think he's done a fantastic job as the Minister of Fisheries. But similarly, there are other you know, uh, fields in which we need to shed more light on, and the basic being our imports outweigh the exports. Mm -hmm. you know, so first a solution needs to come to that, and then slowly uh, others. Consistent policies, Consistent policies for the country. We've been talking about this for years and decades, but we'll talk more after this short break here at Hyde Park to stay with us. Welcome back. We are in conversation with uh, uh, the State Minister for Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure, um, Jeevan Thondaman, who is also the General Secretary of the Ceylon Workers' Congress. Um, you're uh, on the Select Committee of Parliament to identify appropriate reforms of the uh, election laws and the electoral system and to recommend necessary amendments. 
also on the Ministerial Consultative Committee on Urban Development and Housing. But let's focus on the electoral system and uh, recommendations that you're working on. Let's leave the committee aside. What are your thoughts on Sri Lanka's uh, uh, the, the kind of electoral reforms we need to bring in? And um, also the um, constitution of the co country. What kind of amendments, or uh, as we talk about a new constitution, what changes we should usher in um, as we look at a future Sri Lanka? Right. With uh, regards to the electoral reform, and uh, I must say this a bit in advance, with regards to the electoral reform, I am speaking exclusively only for the Indian origin Tamils, mm -hmm. because this will affect them the most directly. So. When you look at the electoral reform, you know, there's been so many rumors, people uh, coming up with their own theories on what the reform could possibly be. But, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I'm in the committee and being in the committee, there have been difference of opinions with many other members of the committee. But I would just like to um, clarify this to, you know, the people watching this and everyone in general. That so when this electoral reform comes about, it needs to address, you know, the issues that we already have. So for example, you, you look at councils where uh, non-elected members are able to turn over the council and where the, there's no smooth functioning of a council and let it be even local government or provincial or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there are these sort of practical issues. But the reason I mentioned Indian Ocean community is because the people who are going to be affected by this, the people whose democ democratic right is going to be denied is this community because they are, as I mentioned earlier, they are scattered across the country. So they are not, uh, other than nowhere area, every other district, Indian origin Tamils are scattered. So when that's the case, if there's a first past the post, then it makes it difficult for us to get a elected representative in. Now we have about say 25 provincial members in the opposition and the ru ruling party representing the uh, local community there. But should an electoral reform which is completely first past the post come in, we would not have a single member. So you know all these people would be denied of their right to democracy. And at the end of the day, we are trying to bring in a reform to ensure the smooth functioning of a government. But this reform, we have to keep in mind, it does not center around just a majority or one particular area. You know, it has to cater to all the communities in that particular place. And other than this, there's also one more issue that you brought about uh, regarding the constitution. With the constitution, we had expressed it to the government that we are, first of all, very unhappy with the fact that there is no Indian origin representative in the uh, committee that is formulating the constitution. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, right now we are in the dark. We are waiting for the draft of the constitution to come in. So the irony is, um, you know, is that we are lawmakers, we are in parliament. We are the ones that need to make the law. But unfortunately, the constitution is not being looked at by any of us. Have you made any representation with the justice minister? We have. we have brought up these issues in multiple occasions for the, over the past uh, two years, in fact. We have brought up these issues in party leaders meeting. We brought up these issues in parliamentary group meetings. We brought this up with all the relevant ministers. But um, you know, uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, clearly that's not working out. But well, I will say this, that when the constitution does come out, the draft, and if we feel that it is not going to cater to the Indian Ocean community, then um, I don't think that our support would be required. Uh, you recently met with Tamil Nadu Chief Minister on the issue of Indian encroachment um, right. into Sri Lanka territorial waters. You urged to bring in amendments uh, to this Indo, uh, the, the Sri Lanka the Maritime Treaty. Treaty. What are these amendments that you urged no, for? So basically, um, the delegation to Tamil Nadu to meet Honorable Chief Minister Stalin was headed by uh, myself, along with Parliamentarian Honorable Rameshwaran and Prime Minister's Coordinating Secretary Honorable Sendhil Tontuma. Mm -hmm. So when we went, you know, each of us had a topic to touch on. So I had spoken about the recognition for the Indian origin Tamils mm -hmm. and along with the development work that needs to be done because, you know, we are lacking that recognition by the Tamil Nadu government. Because uh, as you're aware, even on a global stage, when people say Sri Lanka and people say Tamils, they think of Sri Lankan Tamils who are living in the North and East. They tend to forget that there's a community that has come here close to 200 years ago. So that is what I had gone to speak about. Then um, Honorable Sandal Thondaman, he had uh, spoken about what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. the Kachatheva Treaty and uh, the fishermen issue. So, you know, the Ceylon Workers' Congress for a long time had always, you know, uh, diplomatically handled issues between the two countries when it came to fishermen issues. And even now with the fishermen being stuck here, and there are some of our Sri Lankan brothers who are, you know, arrested in India as well. 
So we went to speak about that as well. And I think we were able to come to a consensus, which we relate to the foreign minister and to the Indian foreign secretary. The Kachatiyu Treaty, however, the specifics are with Honorable Sandal Thondaman, and I think you might have to have him on the show to get some clarity on uh, that. Let's quickly move on to talk a little about uh, national issues such as right. diplomacy and uh, trade investment. Um, I'd like your thoughts <coughs> too as a young politician, as, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's interesting to get your perspectives on uh, where Sri Lanka is heading, what your aspirations are for a future Sri Lanka. Uh, we're talking about regional global power play, China, India and the US. Our finance minister is in India um, uh, having talks with Indian authorities, met with the Indian Premier. Um, but what are your thoughts about uh, Sri Lanka uh, leaning towards um, these superpowers, uh, sometimes more towards one power uh, than the other? See, and also, I'd, I'd also like to add um, just you know something unrelated. When you had asked earlier about the economic situation, mm -hmm. there's one thing that's correlated to this as well. The thing is, you know, we are not, we are not, we are not, we are not a superpower. We are not, you know, one of the big boys. Right, you have China and India, and you know, in this in this sort of situation, we have to see whose sphere of influence we fall under, mm. and we fall under India's sphere of influence directly. Even though China has, you know, come into the country through financial means and through uh, agendas such as that, we still fall into India's sphere of influence, and we do share a rich history with India. Let it be trade, let it be culture, let it be religion. You know, we share a close relationship with India. But however, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to relate it to your question, one thing is, you know, from either post-war, you know, we have focused more on infrastructure rather than policy making, mm -hmm. and that is one of the reasons why we are, you know, where we are right now, because we focus on infrastructure to make our country attractive to investors, to make our country, you know, more investor friendly. But at the end of the day, that just gave us a burden of debt, and it didn't give us a permanent economic plan, like you said, consistency. So, you know, with that being said, see, first of all, we need to show if investors are coming in through any government, we need to show them that there is political stability in our country. If there is no political stability, then no, no one else would uh, be willing to come. There's no carrot, basically. For example, now, the India. The perfect example is the East Container Terminal. Mm -hmm. You know, that was promised to India. And I'm sure everyone is aware of all the drama that unfolded after that. And finally, we had to go back on our word. Now, the thing is, you know, this is an agreement between two countries, you know, two sovereign nations. So when this is an agreement between two nations, it has to be honored. You know, it can't, you can't promise something and then go back on it. Even now, now India had helped us out uh, financially. Even now, this $1 billion line of credit, India had agreed to give it to us. But now they put in certain conditions, and the conditions were quite valid in my opinion. They mentioned that, we need to have an economic plan where we are going to, you know, uh, show returns. So, which is fair for any money lender. But at the same time, towards if you look at the China side of things, they also helped us out financially. But when we came to, you know, a standstill, you know, with one particular fertilizer issue, then everyone saw the agendas that were lurking beneath. And I think that was a reality check for us as well. So regardless of the politics between India and China, you know, regardless of the Indo-Chinese relations, we are not involved in that. We are just here to make our country prosper through the helps of other countries. And there's nothing wrong in it. But, you know, we can't have this political agenda that comes about every time. You know, when it's India, we say we're selling the country to India. When it's the West, we say we're selling the country to the West. Mm -hmm. When it's China, we say we're selling the country to China. At the end of the day, the simplest solution is the you know, simplest explanation is that we are just a small island trying to prosper. It's as simple as that. What's your opinion on the 13th Amendment to the Constitution? Should it be implemented? The 13th Amendment, in my opinion, has to be implemented. Because at the end of the day, even though we are an independent nation, we have to accept the fact that this nation is comprised of many different races, many different entities. And each entity, each race or community, they have their own needs, which can't be addressed by the center. It has to be addressed by the, you know, by the state-run authorities. And, you know, we are not saying that remove the power from the center completely. We are just suggesting that if the 13th Amendment is implemented, it would make life easier for many of the people there, you know. And this is in no way where a foreign entity is going to hold control or where they are going to run things according to their wish. At the end of the day, this is Sri Lanka and we are Sri Lankans and the control is with the center. But, you know, you need to extend that... Uh, 
level of independence to the state-run authorities as well. Uh, if you look at the 13th Amendment, there are so many issues in that, not just devolution. You know, for example, uh, the language factors implement uh, the language factors incorporated in the 13th Amendment. But are we really giving importance to all the languages here? I don't think so. You know, being in the government, it is honestly um, saddening that every time the Tamil language is being neglected, we as ministers have to bring it up with another minister, and we have to go tell them, you know, sir, you have uh, the language has been neglected here, neglected there. But, you know, that is not something that we should bring up. That should be there in the system. But unfortunately, the system has not changed. It's been the same. We've been uh, seeing insurgency, communal riots, um, and uh, uh, disharmony among communities, especially people of faith, uh, of different faith here. Uh, but how do you approach this, uh, the, the question of majority minority concerns in a country today that has become more diverse than it used to be? Right. So I represent Norela district, mm -hmm. as you're aware. And Norela district is, um, well, it's one of the, I think, it's the only district in Sri Lanka where you see an equal proportion of all the races. You know, and we have Tamils, we have Sinhalese, we have Muslims, we have Christians, and you know, we you see an uh, you see a equal proportion. So you know, and this question keeps coming back to us in terms of you know any race-related issue that takes place in the country. And you know, at the end of the day, you can't achieve ethnic harmony, as I mentioned earlier, without having ethnic harmony amongst the politicians. Mm. You know, at the end of the day, it depends on your mentality and your policy making skills. If you are not going to be progressive, if you are choosing to be a regressive politician, then you are going to pave the way for a regressive community. You are going to pave a way for an extremist community. You know, it's not just because, uh, you know, if, if you see riots, um, you know, that, that have been created by the Muslims, for example, immediately we are programmed to label them as religious extremists. But if it is done by, let's say, the Sinhala Buddhist majority, we term it as nationalism. You know, that is the unfortunate reality in Sri Lanka. So, you know, even with even with the 83 riots, I'll give you an example. The Indian origin Tamils were no way involved in any of the riots or wars that took place. But the first community to get affected are the Indian origin community. You know, because uh, unfortunately, we are in a place where we're surrounded by different races. So the first people who do get affected is this community. But coming back to it, the thing is, the only way to solve this ethnic question, you know, is we need more progressive politicians. We need politicians of caliber who are willing to accept, you know, an all-inclusive government. And more than that, you know, you can't allow religion to dictate terms in governance. Does that mean a new breed of politicians or uh, to, to encourage more young people uh, to get into politics and elevate the young politicians? Uh, no, if I may say so, there are parliamentarians right now who are young, who are progressive. For example, you know, ruling party, we have we have Kanchana Vijay Sekhar, we have Nama Rajapaksha, we have D.V. Chanaka, we have Shahan Singh Singh, we have so many young politicians in the, the ruling party who are progressive, who are willing to work across lines, you know, with uh, no sort of qualms. At the same time, even in the opposition, we have progressive politicians. We have Shahanak and Rasamanakam, we have Kavinda Jaywardhana. And, uh, you know, we have, we do, at the, at the end of the day, if you look at the opposition, look at the ruling party, you have progressive politicians on both sides. So it's a matter of time before but the... what's limiting? Uh, because everyone's young. As you know, you know, the youth are not given enough chances in politics, you know, as you're aware. In fact, you know, I'm not going to shy away from saying it. I'm a product of nepotism. If it wasn't for my last name, I wouldn't be where I am today. And it is because of that, I feel I owe a duty to the people. Because the reason why I was voted in Norelia, you know, there are 48,000 fresh voters in Norelia, and close to 90% of them identified themselves with me even though they had a different political belief. Not because of anything, not because they wanted wages or th this development or whatever. They voted for me because they felt that if they voted a young person in, it would open the floodgates for youngsters who enter politics. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, in a future parliament, how, how much would you support women in politics? This is something I'd like to talk about. We've been talking about uh, including 25% of women in politics in parliament. Um, but, but how far have you achieved this? Well, to be honest, if you ask me, I think to, you know, to have this quota system, 25% for women, 35% for women, I think that's a joke by itself. Because to <coughs> simply put, if parliamentarians were elected not based on their gender, then we wouldn't need this. You know, we wouldn't need this 35% reservation for women and things like that. And you know, you see right now in parliament, uh, you know, you see the women caucus. 
each and every woman parliamentarian is doing a phenomenal job. And you know, I have spoken to many of them personally, and I've honestly, the discussions I've had with them have been quite productive. And uh, you know, to answer that question, women do need to be first given the opportunity. If you are given the opportunity, you can excel. But we are not talking about you know even the opportunity right now. You know, like for example, women in a political setup. If you look at all the parties, it is so difficult for women to come in. Especially you look at the parties that are more traditional. Let it be, you know, uh, parties in the up country. Let it be parties in the rural side. Women are afraid to get into politics mainly because of sexual harassment. You know, they are afraid of the amount of issues that will be put on them due to this. And immediately the go-to answer is, you know, you're a woman. You belong in the kitchen. You don't belong in the party office. Mm -hmm. But some women have broken that ceiling. Um, very quickly before we wrap up, we just have a minute here. What are your future aspirations in national politics? Well, my future aspirations in national politics is, you know, to simply put, if you look at the Indian origin uh, representative still now, we have been put in a box, which is the Ministry of Estate, Housing and Community Infrastructure. Let it be the opposition, let it be the ruling party. We have been put into that, you know, box and locked up. It's, I would like to see a time where we do you know, progress enough where we are integrated into mainstream Sri Lankan society, where uh, the representatives of the Indian Ocean community are given something of national importance as well, not just a bone, you know, not just a box where they're shut in, where they've been given estate housing and they just build houses without any real changes. You know, you, you asked me this question, why, have the, why has the rural community not progressed? Well, provided that if uh, we have something where we can make our mark on, I'm sure we'll progress. At the end of the day, it's just about the opportunity. Thank you for making time to uh, drive here to Colombo. Thank you. Uh, from Noradia. We had with us um, the State Minister for Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure, Jeevan Thondaman, joining us here at Hyde Park tonight. We'll see you again next week at the same time with yet another edition. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.